1 Corinthians chapter 7. That's where we're going to be today. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Corinthians chapter 7, continuing Paul's uh, instructions for our lives and the way that we should lead them. If you remember, it's almost a year ago now, uh, in the summertime, we were going through that evangelistic training program uh, for the Sunday school hour called The Story. And the reason it was called that was because the authors wanted you to view evangelism as telling the greatest story ever told, because that's really what the gospel message is. It's a great, not just a great, but the greatest story. And there's a lot of advantages to telling a story in that way, and there's a lot of precedent for doing that as well. As we said, the Bible is laid out like a story. And so it makes sense you would witness to somebody telling them that story. Jesus taught through stories called parables. Uh, stories capture our attention uh, and, and move not only our minds and our, our thinking, but also our emotions as well. They capture our attention in that way. And one of the things that I really appreciated about the way that, that this form of evangelism worked, the, the view of seeing evangelism as a story, is that it really started to get at the heart of who you are. It really started to get at the heart of, of your identity and how you define yourself. But when you hear a story laid out, you know, when you're either reading in a book or hear somebody giving out a story, you can't help but to compare and contrast yourself to the characters in that story. Right? You're trying to figure out, you know, if I was in this situation, who would I be? Would I be the hero? Would I be the villain? Would I be uh, the, the bystander, somebody who's an assistant to the, to the hero of the story? Where would you fit? There's a lot of identity questions that stories bring up in your mind. And what's amazing about the gospel story is that we actually are characters in that story. That's where it becomes so relevant for evangelism. You're telling somebody, this is where your life fits into the world that's around you. This is where your life fits into this gospel story. The gospel answers so many of the identity questions that we have. Who am I? Why am I here? Is there anything that, that's special about me? And it's, it's extraordinarily relevant for today, because today our culture is in an identity crisis. That's why when you look around, at, at, at especially Western culture, everybody's identifying as this, that, and the other thing, because they don't know who they are. At least who they've been told they are, they don't find that as valuable, and so they have to go and find their, their identity in something else. It also explains to you why when you question that identity that they adopt for themselves, why they attack so, so, so strongly back. Because you're questioning their very existence. They put all their worth, their value, everything they are into that special identity. That's what makes them different, special, and important. And when you question that, they feel like you're you are attacking their very existence. And so that's why we see such a, a strong cultural pushback. And the gospel tells us that, that for those who find their identity, who, who seek after identities in all these different places, the gospel tells us you're never going to find what you're looking for. You're never really going to become who you want to be or find that special uh, place in life that you're looking for. Because the only place you can find true identity and value and worth for yourselves is in Jesus Christ and seeking Him. Now, if we're not careful, I think Christians can actually easily fall into the same mindset. Right? We forget who God calls us, the value that He places on us, and instead we look for that value, that, that, that uh, identity in, in what we do, uh, where we go to school, who we're married to, all sorts of different things that we try to find identity and value in, in life. And it's a mistake. And I think it's really what is going to be the theme of our, of our sermon this morning, of this passage. And so that brings us to our main point this morning, which is we can be content with where God has placed us in life because our identity is not found in what we do, but rather it is found in Christ. Now, for context this morning, in the uh, chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul has been giving out principles for marriage. The Corinthians have, it seems like they've written to him and have asked him a whole different bunch of questions. Some are assuming that, that celibacy makes them far more holy, and so they're seeking divorces in order to be more holy unto God. Others are saying that no marriage is what makes you holy, and if you don't marry, then, then you're nothing. Others are in the church, and they're married to unbelievers, and they're trying as hard as they can to try to keep this relationship together, and it's not working for them. So they write Paul with all these different questions, very concerned about these issues. And Paul addresses them very thoroughly one by one, and we've gone over that in different sermons. But he keeps coming back to a similar theme, if you've noticed as we've gone through this passage. He keeps coming back to the theme of calling and gifting that God gives to each and every Christian. God has called every Christian to a different situation, has called them to worship and glorify him in whatever situation that they find themselves in. 
And so what I believe Paul is doing here is, is he's addressing a main problem that seemed to exist in the Corinthian church, which was this. The Corinthians were finding a lot of their identity, a lot of their value and what makes them special, not in Christ and who they are in him, but in their marriages, in the social status that that marriage gives to them. And so Paul is correcting them and reorienting their views and saying, yes, marriage is good, right? It, it, it's a blessing from God. But if that becomes the main emphasis of your life, you're, you're lost. You're just chasing after the wrong things. And you're never going to be satisfied. If they make marriage or being unmarried your core identity, you're lost. And you're making a mistake. And so now getting into the next section of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's going to continue this theme of finding your identity in God instead of other things. So if you read with me our passage this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there, uh, there let him remain with God. So something to notice right off the bat in verse 17, you're going to notice that word called used multiple times throughout this passage. And the question we have to ask is, what, did Paul, what is Paul talking about? He's actually talking about two different callings. And we're going to call them the horizontal calling and the vertical calling this morning. I think that helps us to get an understanding for what Paul is talking about here. The horizontal calling is only mentioned in, in verse 17. I've highlighted some of it in, in, this, in the uh, slide behind me. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. This calling is what we oftentimes refer to as God's will for my life. You'll hear Christians talk about, you know, what God is calling me to do, what God's will for my life is. This is what we're referring to. We're talking about your occupation. We're talking about who you're married to, how many kids you have, what church you go to. These are all horizontal callings, God's will for your life in these areas. The second calling is the vertical calling, which we see in all the other verses. So in, in, in verse 17, we have the horizontal calling. And then throughout the rest of the passage, whenever you see that word called or calling, it's talking about this vertical calling. We see it in verse 18, verse 20, verse 21, verse 22, and then also in verse 24. Here's verse 18, for example. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? We're talking about a vertical calling here. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Once again, we're talking about that vertical calling of God. What is this? This vertical calling is the one that every single believer receives. It's the call to salvation in Jesus Christ, to repent of your sins and look to Jesus to, to, to save you from your sins. And the promise is that everyone who looks to him will belong to Christ. It will become his. It's the same calling that we see in 1 Peter 2.9. He says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this vertical calling is the call to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation, and God will make you his. You'll belong to him. It's, it's an identity change. And Revelation 22, uh, verse 4, summarizes this for us. It says that at the end of time, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. They belong to God. The Christian belongs to God. So this calling from God is an identity change. It's a paradigm shift. It's a complete reorientation of the way that you view yourself and the way that you view your life that God has given to you. You are no longer a nurse or a father or a truck driver or a college student or even a millionaire or a host of other things as you would normally have identified yourself with. You are now a Christian. That's your new identity. You belong to God. And that's where you get your value. That's where you get your identity from. 
So this vertical calling is clear. It's uni universally true for all Christians. They have received this call to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ and that they belong to him. What's more difficult to understand, though, is this horizontal calling that we find in verse 17. Because this is going to change from Christian to Christian, the different circumstances that God has called them to in life. Going back to verse 17. A common question that you will oftentimes hear Christians asking is, you know, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? I, I want to honor God in what I do. I want to make right decisions, and I want to follow his calling. I want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But what is God's will for my, for my life? What job should I take? Who should I marry? Where should I go to school? We want to honor God in these decisions. We want to go where he calls us. But honestly, in the day and age that we live, there are so many different options ahead of, in, in front of us that oftentimes we become petrified. We think, I, I don't know what to do. I don't want to make the wrong decision. I don't want to mess up God's plan for my life. And I think what we, what we have here in 1 Corinthians is Paul is really simplifying it for us. If you look back to verse 24, he says this, So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. So Paul is saying, wherever you were in life, when Jesus called you from darkness to light to be his, to be a Christian, whatever job you were at, who you were married to, who you might be engaged to, what school you were going to, if you can glorify Christ at that job or at that school or in that relationship, then continue to do so. Remain there and continue to worship God and honor him where you find yourself. Honestly, we overcomplicate it. We really do. We overcomplicate the will of God. Paul is telling us that God's will for your life is not about the specific details. We like to think it is, and as we're trying to seek out God's will, we think, well, I've got to make sure that I make a right step here and a left step there, and if I don't hop once, I'm going to be outside of the will of God. And that's not what God's will is. Paul is saying God's will for you is to honor him where you find yourself. That's your primary focus. It gets back to that horizontal calling versus vertical calling. We need to be focused primarily on our vertical calling, to honor Christ wherever we find ourselves, and that will take care of the horizontal calling for you. So let, let's pick on our seniors here. Who all in here is graduating from high school this spring? Ra raise your hands. Higher, I need to see. Oh, you know what? All right, stand up. All right. Or should I have you come up front too? No, I'm just kidding. So these are our seniors, and they're all making decisions. Some of them have already made decisions about what's going to happen this coming summer and this coming fall. Some of them are still trying to make up their minds about it. And it's a big decision for them. And so if you would, please be praying for these guys. This is going to be a gigantic life change and, 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 and shift for them. And many opportunities to glorify God, but many temptations come along with that life shift. So you guys can sit down. Thank you. So how do these guys make up their mind? How do they decide, how am I going to glorify God with my life? I'm sure they've been pestered and pestered by tons of comments. What are you going to do with your life? What job are you going to get? I don't know. It's most of the time the answer they come up with. The, the, the future is very much blind to them at this point. So how do they make up their mind? How do they follow Paul's uh, counsel in this passage? I think Paul's instructions are, find a place where you can glorify God and then do that. It's that simple. Find a place where you can glorify God, whether that be a job, whether that be a school, whether that be a relationship, and then do that. The primary focus is honoring God in that place, not so much what place you find yourself in. For sure, use wisdom, right? Seek out godly counsel in these decisions. Read through the book of Proverbs. I think that's very applicable. If you're coming to a, a major life decision, maybe spend some time in your devotions and just read through the, through the Proverbs and apply those specific verses to the, uh, the, the situation you find yourself in. I think that's wise. And ultimately, if God has a specific place for you in mind, he'll direct you. He's sovereign, right? Uh, that's something I've found to be very true in my life. You know, when I was graduating from high school, I was praying and praying, God, please show me what you want me to do, because I'm very much blind at this point. And I, I thought I had figured it out. I thought I was going to go into a career of welding, because I had taken some welding classes in high school, enjoyed that, thought that was maybe something that I would actually be good at and wouldn't fail at. I was terrified of failure at that time, still am to a certain extent. And so I thought, well, maybe this is the career that I'm in. And so this was the plan that I laid out and thought, all right, well, this, this makes me safe. This makes me comfortable. I'll seek after that. And then God did something. All three of my pastors, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Will, Pastor Rob at the time, approached me separately and said, we really think you should go to Bible school. Why are you doing that? <laughs> that's, that's not my plan. 
That's not what I wanted to do. Because I was terrified of school. I wasn't very good at school in, in high school. And the idea of going off and doing college somewhere, that sounds terrifying. I could fail. And so I thought about it and thought about it and thought, you know what, maybe I should trust my elders' wisdoms more than my own wisdom here. And so I started searching out different places. Maybe I could pursue Bible school. And I found a place. It was Northland, up in northern Wisconsin, the same place that Pastor Jeff went to when he was in college. I thought, all right, well, I, I like this campus. I like the people here. It seems like a good place. I'll put myself out there. And so I applied and was accepted. And I had my plan. It was great. And then that spring, right around graduation time, they came out the news that Northland was out of funding and was going to be closing down that fall. There was my plans, right? And I thought for a second, well, I messed up, right? I'm not following God's will because I, I made a mistake here, and this apparently wasn't where I was supposed to go, right? And I thought maybe I should go back to the whole welding scheme and, and, and forget Bible college. But I continued to, to seek out and, and think, well, maybe I should look at a few different places. And there wasn't a lot of options at that time because we were getting into the summer, and I had to make my applications. And so I toured a couple different colleges, and one that I toured was down in Waukesha, Wisconsin, which was Ethnos 360 Bible Institute, New Tribes Bible Institute at the time. And I, I didn't meet any of the teachers. I met one of the staff, didn't really sit in any of the class or anything like that. All I really gained was the layout of the building and the vision that they have for their students. And they gave me some of the, the materials that explain what they teach in their classes. And I thought, well, okay, this is a place where I can glorify God, so let's try this. And if I don't like it, or if it doesn't seem to be honoring God, then, then we'll move on from there. But let's, let's try this out. And so tentatively, I applied and got accepted and went through that fall, half expecting the building to be burned down by the time I get there. And it wasn't, thankfully, right? But it was at this school that, that I gained a, a deep love and desire for ministry, for teaching, for discipleship making. It's there that I met my wife, and we later got married. Right? It's there that I gained so many different things. And what's really amazing about all this is that right at the time that I graduated and I ended up moving back to the Greenwood area, this position as a pastor opened up. Pastor Will was moving on to, to Wausau, and this position opened up. In other words, everything was stacked against me being here in front of you this morning. Right? My desires, my interests, just the way that life was working out and, and direction. If I had gone to Northland, I would not have been back here in 2017. It wouldn't have happened. Right? Everything was stacked against that happening, but God had a call for my life. And he made a way. Right? God can blow you any direction he wants. He's sovereign over you. Right? He can change whatever situation he wants and put you right where he wants you to be. Just honor him where you find yourself. That's really the message that I've been learning and continue to try to learn. Is don't stress about the details so much as much as honoring him in those details. He'll direct your path. Honor him where you find yourself. Your goal should be to honor him and be sanctified in the decisions that you make. Now, that doesn't mean you sit in your mom's basement playing video games until God drops something in your lap. That's not what God's sovereignty is about, right? It's actually the opposite, right? God's sovereignty doesn't call us to passive laziness until something happens. God's sovereignty calls us to activeness because we know God will direct my path. I will honor him and he's going to direct my path. He's sovereign over me. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. In other words, if your vertical calling is healthy, then your horizontal calling will be as well. And if you are loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, which is your vertical calling, then you will be doing well wherever horizontal calling that you find yourself in. Kevin DeYoung wrote a, a very good book called Just Do Something. Many of you probably are familiar with We used to have it in the library. We probably should fix that and get a copy back in there. Uh, but it goes over this idea of God's will for our life and kind of demysticizes it a little bit, right? It, it kind of explains this kind of idea. And, and uh, DeYoung writes this in the book. So the end of the matter is this. Live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before yourself. Be holy. Love Jesus. And as you do these things... Do whatever else you like, and with whomever you like, whoever, uh, uh, wherever you like, and you'll be walking in the will of God. Get your vertical calling right, and the horizontal calling God will direct you in. Going back to the, our passage then this morning, Paul applies this to a few different circumstances the Corinthians were, were probably questioning Paul about. And the first is circumcision. Verse 18, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. 
At, at this time in church history, in the early church, there were groups uh, that were arising within the church that, that were referred to often as the Judaizers. What these guys were saying was they were going to the churches and saying, no, no, Christians, before you can become a Christian, you must keep the Mosaic Law. In, in other words, what they are saying is that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is not enough. You must first keep God's law, and then his sacrifice will make up for you. So they were instructing, you must be circumcised to be saved by Jesus. You must uh, uh, fulfill all the different commandments in there in order to be saved by Jesus. And so Paul thoroughly debunked their teaching in the book of Galatians. would highly recommend reading that book. On the other hand, there were many Jews who wanted to hide their circumcision. It's kind of hard for us to understand this culture and context, but in that time, uh, anti-Semitism was really growing in the Roman society, really peaked in 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, right? There was a growing anti-Semitism. And so as these guys are in the, in the public baths, uh, in the gymnasiums where, where public nudity was more of a thing, they were concerned, am I going to be looked down on and is my social status going to be hindered because of who I am? Now, now you see the heart behind that, right? The concern is who I am in society. What is my identity? How do I look to those who are around me? This is what Paul then is addressing in this passage. Verse 19 once again emphasizes our point. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. God is calling us to be content with where God has placed us because your horizontal calling is not what defines you. What you do, what you look like, who you come from, that's not what defines you. What defines you is your vertical calling. Our identity is not found in circumcision or in social status that uncircumcision can give. Our identity is what gives us value, what gives us purpose in life, is found in righteously following after Christ. That is what gives us purpose. That's what gives us identity. Galatians 3, 27 through 28 says this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is your new identity. All the other details matter very little in comparison. This does bring up the question, though, why circumcision? Why, why is it not relevant anymore if it was relevant in the Old Testament? What's the deal with this? Well, to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about Old Testament covenants. You know, people back then, when they would make a covenant with someone, uh, they don't dig out parchment paper and put their names at the bottom and say, well, if I fail, then I'm going to have to pay you this restitution fines or go to jail. That's not how they worked. They were a little bit more violent at that time. We call it cutting the covenant, cutting a covenant with someone. What often would take place is you would take animals, you would kill them, and cut them in two. And you'd take one half and put it over here, and you take the other half and put it over here, and then you and the person you were making a covenant with would walk through those dead animals. And the, the application or what you were supposed to be understanding from this covenant was that if I fail to keep my part of the covenant, let me be like them. Covenants had a little bit more teeth back then. A little bit more violent. It's a blood covenant is what it is. And I think this helps us understand what circumcision was meant to be. God commands this to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 11. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Note that it shall be a sign of the covenant. They continue on in verse 14. It says this, Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He has broken my covenant, so he will be cut off from his people. Circumcision was part of covering a covenant with God. It was a constant and intimate reminder that if I break my part of this covenant, keeping God's law, then the rest of me is going to be like that part that was circumcised. I will, the rest of me will be cut off. It's a covenant of blood, and it, would, and it would pass on to future generations as well, because those generations would literally pass through that circumcision. And we actually read about that this morning in the book of Micah, right? We're reading about how the Israelites failed to keep God's law, and so they were cut off from the land. The curse of the circumcision was fulfilled in them. They were cut off. And this ultimately, if you think about it, points us to the need for a Savior, because these people, as they're constantly being reminded through circumcision of, of I need to keep God's law, and if I don't, I'll be cut off. Do I keep God's law? Not even close. No one keeps God's law. Romans clearly tells us that no one does good. No one is righteous before God. No one can keep God's covenant perfectly. So we all deserve to be cut off. 
We all deserve to be removed from God's presence. You deserve it. I deserve it. We all deserve God's wrath and to be cut off from God. And that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. He comes and lives the perfect life that we didn't. He fulfills the covenant for us. We can't keep it, so he does it for us. And then he pays the penalty for us failing to keep God's covenant. He is cut off from God on the cross. He is removed from his people. He is cut off from fellowship with the Father. He receives the punishment that we deserved. He pays for our failure to keep God's law, and then he gives us his righteousness. So we don't need circumcision to remind us of the curse of the covenant because our curse is paid for by Christ. When on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He's saying, I have fulfilled the covenant for you. I have given you righteousness and have paid for your debt. There's nothing left for you to do. I've paid for it all. So your identity is not in the old covenant in the blood of circumcision, but in the new covenant made by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews tells us that. Verse 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Here's something you need to realize, though. If you are not in Christ this morning, if you are not trusting in Him to save you from your sins, you are still cut off from God. Your sin separates you from Him, and you will spend eternity separated from God unless something changes, and that's what we call hell. It's an eternity separated in the torments of being separated from God. We're talking about an identity change today. That's kind of our theme. The sad fact is, if you are not in Christ, the Bible gives you an identity, and it says that you're an enemy of God. That's the identity that it gives you. Philippians 3, 18 through 19 says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and their glory, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. This is the fate for all those who are outside of Christ. Eternal separation from God. Your end is destruction. But it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to have that identity forever. You can have a change, continuing on, Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You can have that identity today if you trust in Christ. You can have that identity change. And if you have questions about what that means or you want to know more about it, please find me afterward. I would love to explain to you how you can have this change in identity, how you can have this change in future where you are no longer cut off from God, but you are joined to God. You are grafted into his family. That's an amazing promise, and it's open for everyone if you will believe. So please come and find me if you have questions about that, if you want to go from an enemy of God to being a citizen of heaven. Going back to Paul's illustration of circumcision or or, uh, uh, layout of circumcision, we can understand not wanting or needing that to change today. That's not really relevant for our culture, so it doesn't really bug us. But in verse 21, Paul does start stepping on our toes. He says this, verse 21 through 23, Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called as a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. That word bondservant there that's used throughout the text. Well, uh, let me ask this. Does anybody have anything different in their Bibles outside of bondservant? Most of you probably have a translation that writes bondservant. That, that, that word literally means slave. It really should be translated that way. The only reason it's not most likely is because slavery in the Roman times wasn't quite as brutal as we're accustomed to thinking about slavery from the American South. And so to give that idea, most translators will say bondservant, but it literally does mean slave. And however you translate it, one thing is clear about these people. They belong to somebody. They're not their own. They're not free. They're somebody's property. And this is where Paul steps on our toes, right? He says, if you were a slave when called by Christ, do not be concerned about it. Don't worry about it. Be content. Not very American of Paul. 
right? <laughs> not very liberty-minded of Paul to say, eh, don't worry about your freedom. Don't worry about not being a slave. If you can get it, good. It's better that way. But don't, be, don't worry about it, right? It, 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 it punches us where we don't like to be punched. So I, I think there's two reasons why Paul has this mindset and view towards slavery. To be clear, Paul is not saying that slavery is a good thing. He's not endorsing slavery or, or, or saying that we should desire it or, or practice it today. He's simply addressing those who find themselves in that circumstance. And I, I think there's only two answers for why Paul has this view for those who are in slavery. The first one is maybe Paul doesn't understand how bad slavery can be. You know, maybe he's unaware he's only seen slaves in higher positions in society. Slaves in the Roman times could actually gain very significant status in, in the Roman Empire. Because if somebody mistreated the slave, a very wealthy and powerful individual, they're going to be hearing about it from that person. Right? You mistreated my slave, my property. Right? Kind of like if you scratch a guy who's got, you know, a thousand, hundred thousand dollars in his truck, you're going to be hearing about it. Same thing for slaves back then. You could be treated well. But let's be clear. Yes, slavery generally wasn't quite as brutal. In, in ancient Rome as it was in, in the South, uh, in, in the American South. But this was true for slaves. Your master could kill you for any reason. It didn't really matter. And he would not be prosecuted. Maybe he'd be looked down on in society as a slave killer, but he wouldn't be prosecuted. The, the same thing was true about sexuality. Uh, your master had sexual rights over you and, and could do with you as you wish and would not be prosecuted. Slavery was truly a terrible thing in that time as well. Maybe Paul just isn't aware of this. Maybe he just thinks, well, slavery is not that bad. Be content with where you're at. Maybe that's where he's going. I, I don't think this is the case, though. Paul knows what it means to be in chains. He was in prison many times, right? He's been to all, pretty much every corner of the Roman Empire. He's seen what slavery can be like, and yet he still holds this view. So why can Paul say to slaves, be content with where you're at? Why can he say that to them? And I think the reason is this. I think the reason is this. A new identity in Christ is so incredibly valuable and life-altering that who cares if on this earth if you're a slave? In comparison, it's nothing. And I think Romans 8.18 confirms this for us. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul isn't saying that slavery isn't bad. He's just saying that in comparison to who you are in Christ and the value that that is, slavery doesn't matter all that much. This is so much more value and should consume your life so much more and should be where you place all of your hope, all of your joy, all of your identity in comparison to being a slave. This is so much more great. This is so much more glorious. Don't be concerned about the fact that you're a slave. Be concerned that you belong to Christ. And that's ultimately what he says there in that passage. Let's see if I can find the verse. Um, Verse 21, were you a bondservant when called, do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord is a bondservant, uh, as a bondservant, is a freed man of the Lord. If you are a slave, it doesn't matter because you are truly free in Christ. That's where true freedom is found. And if you are a freed man and you, you feel like you can gloat and say, well, I've, I've built myself up in life, don't forget, you are a bondservant of Christ. You belong to him. This is true, universally true for Christians. I can't help but think of, of Joseph here as, as we're talking about slaves and, and people who have been put in circumstances that they would never have wished to be in. You know, think about the life of Joseph. He grows up in a semi-wealthy family, is, is the, the one who receives all of his father's affections and his brothers out of jealousy. You know, we're talking about contentment this morning. Well, they had the opposite of contentment, which is resentment, and it can lead you to terrible things. Be careful when you have those feelings of resentment because it can lead you to terrible places. They sell him into slavery. And he goes down to Egypt, foreign land, place he uh, does not understand, foreign language. Everything about his life has changed. And does Joseph sit down, he whines and he complains and says, I give up. I'm done on life. No. Does he hatch a plot to, to kill his master and set himself free? You know, if you wrote a movie today about somebody like Joseph, that's how it would go. Joseph would go into slavery and then he'd start hatching a plan to, to kill all the evil slave owners and then bring himself back to the promised land and then have revenge on his brothers. That's how a modern day script would go. That's not what he does either. What does he do? He gets to work glorifying God where he's at. He says, all right, this is where I'm at. Let me honor God where he's placed me. Why? Because he belongs to God and that's enough for him. 
And it works, right? Joseph rises in that household and becomes a prominent individual and, and is pretty well off in life. He's loved by his master. He's trusted by his master. He has lots of provisions for himself. Probably a very comfortable life. Possibly even more comfortable than he had when he was back in Canaan. And then what happens? He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, is thrown into prison, and the key gets thrown away, and he's forgotten about. And surely now, Joseph is going to roll over like a dead dog and say, Enough, God. I've tried, and this is where you placed me. I'm done. Well, surely now he's going to try to at least escape from prison, right? He's going to hatch some plot with the other prisoners, kill the prison guard, and escape. That's not what he does there either. What does he do? He gets to work honoring God where he's at. He says, all right, God, this is where I am. This is where you have for me. I will be content here because I am loved and I belong to you. And that's all the value that I need in life. And what's the result? He saves his family and, and most of the humanization, the humans in that, in that part of the world. Right? Through Joseph's contentment and his decision, I'm going to honor God even the lowest of circumstances and the place I hate to be. The result is salvation for the people. Right? Do not ever forget what God can do in the lowest of circumstances that you find yourself in, whether that be a job, whether that be a relationship, wherever that be, do not underestimate God's power to use you in those places. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Joseph certainly can say that. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's what Joseph's brothers experienced for themselves. Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is, a, it, is, uh, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And we don't think that's the result. As we are discontent in the situations and we, we seek after our own benefit and to find ourselves in something, we don't think the result is going to be piercing ourselves and, and, and hindering our faith, but that's what 1 Timothy tells us. It warns us about the, the dangers of being resentful but not being content with where God has placed you. Now, Paul does go on to say that most likely being free will give you more opportunities to serve God. So if you get the chance to be free, if your master offers you it, or if you can work yourself out of slavery, which was a thing in Roman culture most of the time, do that, because it'll give you greater opportunities to serve God, serve the church, serve others. But notice the reason he tells you to do it. It's not because it gives you a better social status, or makes you more wealthy, or makes you happier in life. It's because you can serve God more. Always go where, God, where you can serve God more, wherever that may be. And if you can't, then stay where you are and be content. Verse 24 summarizes all of these points for us at the very end. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. So, so Christian, I have to ask you, what concerns you in this life? What concerns you? What has your heart? What has your attention? Is it your social status? Is it your bank account numbers? What job you have? What school you're going to? Whether you're married or not? How much do these things matter to you is, is the question Paul is bringing up here. Not that these things are worthless. Not that, that seeking after a, a better job in some place where, where you can enjoy your work a little bit more. Not that that's a bad thing. But the question is, how much does that concern you? What value are you placing on it? There is wisdom in planning. Don't get me wrong. We should want every decision that we make to be wise and God-honoring. But do you get your worth from these things? Do you identify yourself in these things? You know, to do a, a thought experiment to help you understand this a little bit, you think about something that is very valuable to you, that you find a lot of joy in or in doing, and, and ask yourself, if that thing was gone tomorrow, what would be my response? W would that be an identity crisis for me? Would I lose my faith? Would I question God's goodness? What would be your response to these things? And I'm not saying that's not tragic. It is tragic, right? Always remember, Jesus Christ contented himself to live amongst us, take on human flesh, and be like himself, be like us, and he cried tears. It was a, a traumatic event for him in that way, but he was content in God, and he did it, because that is how he honored God with his life. So yes, for sure it would be heartbreaking, but would it fundamentally change who you are? There's a, a group, a musical group called Beautiful Eulogy, and they wrote a song called If. 
And in that song, they explore this kind of concept of what if tomorrow my wife was dead, my children were gone, I lost my job, I lost my health, what would be my response? And they explore how, how that, uh, that, that, that loss would affect them. And then they explore the sovereignty of God, that God would keep them. He would sustain their faith through those things. And, and they write this. What's concealed in the heart of having is revealed in the losing of things. In other words, when we have things, it's hard for us to understand how much value we're placing in them and how much of our identity is wrapped up into that thing. It's only once you lose that thing that you start understanding, was that an idol in my heart? Was that where I truly got my value? Was that where I was replacing where I should be in Christ with that thing? In other words, losing the gifts that God gives us in this life is tragic, but it does reveal where our joy is found. Is it in the giver or is it in the gift? Christians, who are you? What defines you? It should be that you belong to Christ. This has to be the most valuable thing to you because everything else about you is going to change. Your health is going to disappear. Your kids are going to grow up and move out of your house. Your spouse is one day going to die. Your job could be gone tomorrow. You know, we live in such a day and age where, you know, we get scared by our phones all the time. What if a bomb blows up? What if an EMP drops? What if all these different things happen? Your life can change in an instant. So where do you find your value? Where do you find your hope and your joy? It has to be that you belong to God. The answer has to be that I'm a Christian. I belong to Christ and he gives me my identity. That is the only sure and unchanging identity and it, it's, it's beyond value. With God really is the key in this passage. If you underline your Bibles, I would highly recommend underlining that. It emphasizes the point of this passage. Remain with God where you're at. Wherever God has placed you in life, he has done that for a reason. He is sovereign. He is with you there. He has called you to honor him wherever you find yourself today and tomorrow and next year. So be content where you are because you belong to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day that you've given to us in this word of scripture. It is hard for our hearts to understand this, God, because we are so seduced by the things of this world. And there's so many things that promise that if we do this or if we get here, that will make us happy, that will give us true value, and we'll feel better about ourselves. And it's all a lie. All those things lie. The only place that we can find joy, the only place that we can find fulfillment and true identity is in Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you would strengthen our souls to be able to see life that way to value the salvation of Jesus in such a way that would change the way that we look about everything around us. God, I pray for those who are in positions in life that are just difficult. They are just sorrowful and painful. They're at a job they don't like. They're in a relationship that they don't love. They feel unrewarded in so many different areas. Father, they are facing difficult things, and I pray that this passage would encourage them that despite all of the difficulties around them, that they would compare those sorrows to the joy that they receive in Christ and be willing to say, yes, it's difficult, but I can get through another day, to, uh, another day because I have Christ. Father, I pray that you give us that heart. I pray that we would see you as in, uh, valuable beyond all other things, above, above all imagination, and that we would love you truly, and that would lead us into the callings you have in life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll please stand with me.